and uh, good afternoon to everybody and it's lovely to see uh, such interest. Um, I have lived in Maynooth for over 40 years and I actually did my dip in the college uh, in the 70s um, but you really take the college for granted, you come and go through it, you don't know an awful lot about it and um, so when I retired I decided well I want to find out a bit more like uh, why it's in Maynooth and um, how it came to be here and uh, why it has such a, a variety of different buildings. Um, so I started doing a lot of reading and that's what I'd like to share with you today, some of the things I've discovered. So I, I hope it covers things you're interested in, in and that um, you enjoy the slideshow. So I move over now to, um, to, a sli to the slideshow and hopefully uh, this will work on screen. Sorry. <clears throat> My talk is, is called Catholic College for a Catholic People and um, the Royal College of um, St. Patrick's, which is its actual original name, was founded in 1795 by an Act of Parliament Ireland. and the 1700s have seen the penal laws in Ireland and this has prevented Catholics from getting an education here. So mostly they were trained on the continent, places like France, Austria, Netherlands, Rome and Spain. But by the 1790s there were great changes occurring, um, mostly in France with the French Revolution. Ideas of liberty and equality and freedom of speech and freedom of religion. And they closed down Catholic colleges, sending the, the students home. Now this was a great worry for the powers that be here in Ireland when you got these ideas of liberty and freedom of worship. And this was compounded by the rise of the United Irishmen in Ireland and um, these were a mixture of mainly Catholics but some Presbyterians as well um, who were both affected and repressed by the penal laws and were undermining perhaps the political stability. So the government decided the time had come to try and, and do something to uh, relax some of the penal laws and the big act occurred in 1793 an act which allowed for university education for Catholics and this, this was a big step forward and two years later Trinity College opened its, its doors to Catholic uh, people. Well that's all very well but Trinity College was a Protestant institution and was able to keep its uh, eyes on the, the development of Catholics so it really wasn't very much freedom for the Catholics and it was a man called Edmund Burke who was a liberal politician and sympathetic to the Catholic cause. He was a Protestant and he came to the aid of the bishops and he advised caution. He said, declare your loyalty to the, to the crown, but ask, demand a Catholic college, something separate to Trinity College. And he said that they have to insist that they get a Catholic college governed and peopled by Catholics only. And his advice to the bishops was, a Catholic college for a Catholic people only. And it was help that finally led to the Act of June 1795, which led to the formation of a group of trustees um, who were allowed to buy land, fundraise and set up a Catholic college. And um, Burke ironically is seen outside Trinity College himself. So why Maynooth? Well, the reason is quite simply because William, the second Duke of Leinster, um, offered them a building here, Storyt House. Um, the building came with 60 acres of land on favourable leasing terms, good distance from Trinity College most importantly, and it had the patronage of the Dukes of Leinster which was no mean thing and there being a, a very important Protestant family. And so this is where the first college set up in this building. Um, it, 40 students and seven professors and um, some of them were French and some of them, most of them had, had actually lived abroad training priests there. And they moved into this building. Now at the time, it was two story with an attic. But now you have um, an extra layer to added to the building. So you had um, an upstairs room, rooms, and then you had in the basements, you would have had classrooms, you would have had uh, eating areas, you would have had resting areas, and you would have had staff and students sharing alike but it was a lovely Georgian building as you can see lovely door and the this the sash windows and inside it was very elegantly decorated this is the inside now of the entrance and uh, some lovely stucco work by 
um, famous Michael Stapleton. But one thing to notice here, this niche uh, was used to put a statue of King George III, following Burke's advice uh, that they wanted to make sure that there was going to be nothing but loyalty to the crown and nothing untoward going on um, this distance from Trinity College. Uh, in the grounds were a number of yew trees dating from the time when the Fitzgeralds actually lived in the castle outside of the college. And this one, a famous one called Silken Thomas Tree. And Silken Thomas was the son of Garrett O. Fitzgerald. And it's said that he sat under this tree on the night before he rebelled against the king, Henry VIII, um, and played his harp under the tree. Um, it seems a very strange thing to do, to play your harp under a tree the night before you go into battle, but um, the tree still carries his name, Silken Thomas, and um, it's, it actually dates from that time. So uh, it's a lovely link between the, the castle and um, the, co the college buildings. The, the first purchase that was made um, by the trustees was this sundial, and it was put on a plinth or a, a, col a column that the Duke of Leinster had given them. And it provided a, a focal point to this new educational institution. It sort of looked uh, as if science was kind of an important aspect, but it was also a very fashionable thing to do in, 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 the, in the garden. And the sundial is still here, but uh, the statue of the king inside has long since gone. Uh, numbers rose very, very rapidly. Now it was possible for students to, to be educated here. And within two years, an extension had to be built. And you can see on either side of Stoit House, um, a wing 200 feet um, on either end. And this was known as Long Corridor. It was built quite rapidly and uh, it provided accommodation for 200 extra students. Um, this is the back of it. And you can see there Stoit House and you can see that the wings on either side the entrance for carriages to come in, bringing students, bringing provisions. Um, at one end, at the northern end, which is down that direction, there was a big chapel, St. Joseph's Chapel, and at the other end, there was a refectory where the students um, could eat. And hence, the name of the chapel was used for this, this garden area, St. Joseph's. But at this time, uh, not only were uh, clerical students brought in, but there was a great demand for um, young boys, young men of uh, Catholic gentry to gain an education. There were no boarding schools in Ireland uh, and there was a good demand, big demand for a good education for these young men. And to this end, there was a, a, another building on the land. Um, it had been built, in fact, by John Stoit's father about a year or two earlier. It was called Tyra House and it was bought by the trustees and it was used for this lay university and it was renamed Riverstown House. And Riverstown House was, was used until the building of Clongos Wood College, uh, which took the boys away. But um, they, they were uh, educated separately. Some of, the, of their uh, classes coincided, but generally speaking, they would have had class halls down below and accommodation above their own grounds here for recreation. Um, and one of the things they were offered at the time here was fencing. Um, gradually, St. Joseph's Square developed. First of all, you had this building here, which attached itself in the corridor, was known as New House. And on the south side, you have two buildings here, Humanity House, and further along, you have Dunboyne House, providing this three sides, this, this very attractive um, Georgian Square, typical Georgian um, architecture. You can see um, the lovely door here with the fan windows letting light in. And uh, the same at the both wings, they have these doors, sash windows, and um, just simple but elegant and typical uh, as Georgian Square that you might come across in the center of Dublin. But one of, on the south side, you have a, a very unusual um, a development in that this house here, Dunboyne House, was built first. And there was a big, big gap. There was no building here. It was built separately. And it was built under unusual circumstances. The, uh, in 1785, John Butler, who was the Bishop of Cork, found that he had inherited 
um, the title of the Lord Dunboyne and lots of lands in County Meath. He became a rich man and uh, he was very keen that he would have an heir to succeed. And to this end, he applied to the Pope for dispensation to marry. Now, if Henry VIII couldn't get a dispensation to marry, it was very unlikely that this lowly Bishop of Cork was going to get a dispensation. So he was refused and he left the priesthood and married a distant cousin. But unfortunately, they had no children, which actually wasn't surprising since he was in his 70s. On his deathbed, with no family, no children, uh, he was full of remorse and applied to Rome to be brought back into the Catholic Church. Uh, he was promised uh, a reply from Rome, um, but he died before any reply came. Now, the reply was presumably that he wasn't going to be accepted back into the Catholic Church. Um, but he was due to bequeath a large sum of money if he did so. Uh, it is said that the priest who gave him the last rites apparently whispered in his ear before he died, once a priest, always a priest. So the man died happily and it actually had a happy ending because as a Catholic, he wouldn't have been able to bequeath money. But as a Protestant, he could. And in a law case that followed with his family, he was found to be Protestant since nothing had come from Rome. So the money was passed on to the new college and the trustees were delighted and they decided to use the funds to set up Dunboyne House in his name, uh, which is this building here. Now, Dunboyne House was to be used for 20 select students, students who had shown themselves to be gifted and would be going on to do postgraduate research, one of them being Nicholas Callum. And because they were separate and, and uh, special students, they were given the luxury of bedrooms with a fire which meant they could keep themselves warm. Directly above and in an undivided corridor were housed the library of ancient manuscripts, archives, documents, uh, priceless, and no fire doors, no healthy directly above these fires. Um, the Candelabrum, which you see in the entrance to the new college, the neo-Gothic part, is actually um, something that belonged to this Bishop of Cork and was retrieved at a later stage and brought back to the college. And uh, it's now in the entrance hall of uh, just up by the President's Arch. And I think a lot of people actually walk under it and don't notice it, but it's a very fine candelabrum, but it dates from the Bishop of Cork's days uh, when he was a cleric. Uh, Interestingly, a map of Carton, which was done by um, the Duke of Leinster, uh, they, it was still their land and often they would come with cartographers, shows Mrs Dunboyne House and a big gap between it and Humanity House was built, which was built afterwards. Now it's very much out of scale, but it does show you that this was built um, at a distance for the postgraduates and this was built at a later stage. By now, you had a very, very lovely square, elegant Georgian buildings. There's Dunboyne House in its entirety with its chimneys um, for, the, for the fires um, and a very, a very beautiful garden for the students to walk in. But inside was very different. This was taken from inside a long corridor and it's a huge contrast to what you see in the new modern neo-Gothic building. Here you've got very linear, very functional building. And it was, it was built at a time when there was very, very little money, but huge demand um, for student accommodation. Um, so it is in total contrast with the elegant square outside. And even the color um, lacks any, any interest. But what was lacking in color of the decoration uh, was made up for by the color of some of its inmates. And this is the Reverend Dr. Nicholas Callum, um, who was Professor of Natural Philosophy, perhaps we would say physics today. Um, and he was a professor from about 1826, and he was involved in the development of electricity. Uh, he was the man that invented the induction coil, which is a way of um, increasing your electric charge, uh, the sort of thing that you find in a car when you turn the ignition on and it gets the engine going. 
In his early work, he experimented with chickens, which he found very, very easy to get at the college entrance because there was a little farm there. And he got a bit more confident and he got his students to uh, line up, hold hands while he sent the electric charge along. And as the current got stronger further along the line, he witnessed uh, their reaction. Now you can see by his face, he possibly was, was a man that you wouldn't like to turn down if you were asked to volunteer. And uh, there were no fatalities recorded, um, but he did add to the great scientific achievements of his day and, and to, to the present day. But while working in the basement of Stoit, because that's where his rooms were, he noticed that his iron equipment was beginning to rust, uh, which, which irritated him. And um, so he developed a form of galvanizing it. And to this day, it's been patented, a patent galvanized iron. So he was a very eminent scientist and, and, a, and a great benefit to the college. And he's buried in the, the um, college graveyard and one of the lecture halls has been named after him. Now, shortly after this, still in the Georgian period, you have the building of Logic House, obviously for um, scientific subjects, and Rhetoric House. And it's in Rhetoric House that you have this very famous ghost room. In February 1841, a troubled student cut his throat and threw himself out of the window to his death. And 19 years later, in a copycat suicide, uh, a second student cut his throat and threw himself out to his death too. Troubled by this, the trustees took away the wall of the room and opened it up and made it into an oratory. And the oratory is still there today. And uh, th thankfully, there have been no more suicides, but it's led to great folklore and lots of yarns among college students. You don't go to Manus without hearing about the ghost room and the cloven feet that appear and the bloodstains on the floor of the room that appear from time to time. But uh, I think the most vivid story is that of uh, a student claiming that he was uh, shaving at his mirror one morning when a figure appeared uh, behind him in the mirror and using his fingers to cut his throat, he was urging the student to use his razor blade to do the same. And perhaps this is how people thought uh, the situations had occurred. Um, but whatever the stories, the college has its, its ghost room story and uh, as most good colleges do. Interestingly enough, this is a map, an Ordnance Survey map of 1838. And it shows very, very clearly Stoit House, Long Corridor, uh, New House, and then here you've got Dunboyne House with the library above, and you've got Humanity House. Here was Riverstown, which was the lay college, and here would be rhetoric and logic. And at this stage, because of student numbers, uh, the, there was a division made between the junior house and the senior house. And this area was where the junior uh, college students uh, tended to stay. Their classrooms were here and they used this big field as their recreation. And after a couple of years in the college, they graduated to the senior part, which was here. But you notice here, it's known as the Royal College of St. Patrick, obviously very loyal to the, to the crown. You can see in the grounds here, um, that was the uh, graveyard that was opened in 1817 and the glade, which is still there today, although it's much, much shorter. But that was um, there before any buildings occurred. There are gardens, obvious, but what I want you to have a look at here mm -hmm. is the fact that there's a brewery. In 1834, a brewery was opened up because beer was being offered to the students uh, with their dinner in the evenings. And um, probably it was safer than drinking the water, but it was available. And because there were so many students, there was a brewery developed on site, quite close to the canal and um, the, the raw ingredients. On, in June 1840, following a visit from a father, John Matthew, on the evils of drink and on temperance, half the students and most of the staff decided to give up the beer and to stick to tea. So uh, as a result of that, the brewery closed. It's no longer there. And in its place, uh, a gasworks was, was built. You can see the remains of it today. And the gasworks actually provided for heating um, for the new neo-Gothic building when it was built. In 1845, 
there was a huge change to the college. It was a watershed year. It, at that stage, um, Robert Peel, the Prime Minister of England, uh, decided it was time to, to court the Catholic vote, if you like, um, by sending money for rebuilding. It was badly needed, more accommodation, and Peel decided that now is the time um, to, to send money to help St. Patrick's College um, and ensure we had Catholic loyalty and Catholic vote. So a large grant, 30,000, was given to Manu. And the trustees brought in this man, Pugin, Augustus Welby Pugin, as their architect. He uh, recently turned Catholic and had just finished the Houses of Parliament in London, where he particularly was involved in the internal design and, and building. Pugin had very elaborate and grandiose plans, extravagant, expensive, uh, but you, as you can see from this, um, is spectacular. And this is the facade you usually see um, for St. Patrick's College Manu, but totally different style. Pugin was an architect in neo-Gothic style, which was very uh, common, uh, very fashionable in Victorian times. We're now into the reign of Queen Victoria. And uh, he wanted his building to be uh, seen from the main road of Maynooth. And as a result, he suggested that Stoyt House be knocked down so that people could actually see uh, his lovely frontage um, from the road. Uh, it's known as St. Patrick's um, front and it's built of limestone. And you can see from the, the close up here, uh, it's typically Gothic, Gothic, everything pointing up to heaven. The windows small but pointing upwards and this lovely oriel window above what we call the president's arch because the president lived above it and this was the main entrance into the college very very different architectural style and um, a different era inside <clears throat> in total contrast to what you saw in long corridor is you have these lovely cloisters much wider about 12 foot and this beautiful again archways all the way down which the painting has, has actually um, enhanced and um, ceiling work of interest and above the doors you have some lovely stencil work and these cloisters then go around a garden St Mary's Square and uh, bring in a lot of light. Upstairs you have bedrooms, downstairs you have the refectory, you have kitchens, uh, classrooms and um, you have the open garden as I say. Along this floor was developed upstairs initially, and then it developed for the whole floor, the Russell Library. Now, it was originally just called the New Library. It wasn't named the Russell Library till 1984, but it must have been a huge relief for the trustees to have the valuable documents and manuscripts transferred from the top of Dunboyne House into this safety of this beautiful library, which was elaborately decorated with the lovely ceiling and this timber structure work. Um, around the door, you have this lovely <coughs> decoration and freezers along the top here, which you can see in a bit more detail. <coughs> All of it um, typical of Pugin's interiors. Everything has to be decorated, both inside, outside, stonework, plasterwork, and so on. Um, the, the library uh, was as, as, uh, grand, as grand, if you like, uh, as the big dining hall in, in a different way. This size, uh, big building or this, this big hall was where the students ate. Uh, very, very large windows and again, uh, a lovely ceiling. At the end was a very, very interesting piece of architecture, um, most unusual, and particularly since it doesn't open to the outside. Here you have three arches and they don't open, they're just decoration and beautiful stained glass at the top of each. And it's surprising to see, um, myself included, that loads of people walk into Pugin and I don't think they even notice this is here, um, but it's a most unusual feature. And um, the Pugin building was completed in 1857. And um, it's the one that, as I say, you see the facade mostly uh, for St. Patrick's College. One thing that Pugin didn't succeed in doing, however, was to provide a chapel because he ran out of money. His plans were so grandiose. And uh, it was the president, Charles Russell, that decided a chapel was needed. 
and in 1858 he made renewed attempts to fundraise for the chapel. Um, but as numbers in the college were rising, uh, you will also have uh, numbers of students with health problems. Now, during the famine times, the Board of Works had been in charge of providing money um, for the college, but it was used mainly for repairs, particularly in the, in the old buildings, Stoit House and so on. So there was very little money available. And in 1861, there was an outbreak of TB in the college, lasted about four years, killed at least 20 students. Um, and a bit like the COVID of today, um, it, it was necessary to isolate these students, to get them out of the way and to treat them. So any money that, that might have been raised for a, a college chapel was, was uh, put into the development of um, an infirmary, which is still there today. So it was 1875 before a chapel was finally built that could take the uh, 500 students that now existed and um, between junior house and senior house. Now they did have chapels, um, but there was nowhere for them all to worship together. So this was the first time that a chapel to provide um, worship for everybody together came about. And it wasn't built by Pugin, as a lot of people think, because Pugin was dead at this time. And it was built by a man called J.J. McCarthy, who built in a similar style to Pugin. And you can see here, and the two buildings blend very sympathetically. It took six years to build this, um, and then four years to decorate with a gap in between for fundraising. Uh, now, I'm very conscious that there is to be a talk tomorrow on the college chapel, so I'm not going to say anything on it, but I'm, I can't really cover the college without giving you a glimpse of how um, glorious the inside is, and how, again, it is very like what was in the Pugin building um, with elaborate decoration. Um, these just show you how elaborate um, the, the, the structure is. This is the Lady Chapel at the back of the main altar and uh, is quite famous because this is where Princess Grace of Monaco, Prince Rainier and the family came and had mass when they were staying in the 1960s um, in Maynooth. Here you have just more details of how elaborate it is. And at the back you have the organ which is now still being played for the carol service, for uh, organ recitals, and the man who built the original, had the original organ built, was a Heinrich Beverunge, um, who is buried in the church graveyard, which you see here. The 1850s saw the levelling of all the parkland you saw in the map earlier, and uh, it actually uh, was then that the graveyard, which had been um, there since 1817, was actually planted and uh, fenced in. It hadn't been previous to that. And these lovely yew trees provide a fabulous arch into this graveyard, again with this lovely gothic door, this gateway. And it's in this graveyard that you have um, they, some of the early professors. Um, you have uh, Dr. Angolade, I think was one of the very, very early French professors here, he's buried there. Um, Nicholas Callan is here, uh, Charles Russell, the president, and Eugene O'Browny, who was the vice president of the Gaelic League and the priest here. Um, is also buried as a mausoleum to him. Um, some of the sisters who nursed in the infirmary and there's a lovely graveyard to one of the gardeners, um, a respected gentleman I think he's described as, um, he's there. Now about this time there was a visit from an unusual lady. She was the Empress Elizabeth of, Elizabeth of Austria and she was, she was staying nearby with friends and uh, she strayed onto college land uh, while on a stag hunting party. Known as Sissy, she was a very flamboyant lady and very beautiful lady. She was one of the beauties of Europe. And, uh, and when she strayed onto the land, she obviously was noticed. Uh, she was welcomed in most, most uh, greatly and treated to afternoon tea and a guided tour. And so taken was she with the college and with its, uh, the welcome and the treatment she had. that when she got back to Vienna, she's present a silver statue of George the, and the dragon, because she thought St. George was the patron saint of Ireland. The following year, she was invited back because uh, she enjoyed her trip so much, she requested a, a second visit. And this time, somebody had obviously advised. And her gift of thanks that she sent back to the college, these beautiful vestments, which are actually in the, in the um, 
uh, still in the college today in the museum and they are um, with gold decoration, gold embroidery and most importantly you've got the shamrocks of Ireland so she got it right this time. Other visitors to the college have included uh, Pope John Paul II in 1979 uh, as well as some of the kings of England and of Spain to see the Salamanca archives. Uh, as a result of the visit, foundation stone was laid and in 1984 you have the John Paul II um, library was completed, which was uh, lovely because it joined the university new campus with St. Patrick's College and provided a, a link now between the university and the seminary. In the 1960s, lay students were um, in, in, introduced to the college and uh, today they make up a large bulk there being only about 33 resident seminarians, but there are many religious and lay people from Ireland and particularly from abroad who come and study in the new, um, in the seminary. Um, here you see the famous spire, which is probably a landmark of the college and uh, was built in 1902. It was intended for the centenary of 1895 um, but because of, of the lack of funding, it, it took a little bit longer, but it finally got built, 273 feet of it. And it was as a result of the work of Dennis Gargan, who was, um, he was president at the time. Uh, he was 82. And following the completion of the spire, he was treated to a very sumptuous dinner, uh, which was supposed to be uh, recorded as a very boisterous affair indeed. He died the following year at the age of 83 and a happy man. Um, you can see the spire like round towers, you can see from a big distance away. So it draws you, draws you to the college. Um, here you have the chapel lit up. Uh, at the, there, ha there have been uh, about 10,000 priests through the college um, in its 225 years. Many have gone out missionary work, many working in Ireland um, and many uh, the likes of John Hume, uh, who weren't actually ordained, but have gone out to do Troj Trojan work um, since. In December 2018, in this chapel here, there was a carol service, as there is every year. And at this carol service, the opening procession was led by the ladies of the Schola Gregoriana Choir. And it was the first time that ladies had actually led the procession of seminarians down the main aisle. There's a mosaic in the chapel which invites young men to praise God. Uh, I think the phrase is laudate pueri dominum. Um, but now it's very much a case of young men and young ladies um, praise God. So the college has seen many great changes in its 225 years. Um, but the traditions, the spirits of its residents and its visitors, and its lovely buildings live on to today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pat. Um, that was fantastic. We have a couple of questions, okay. so I'm just going to hand you over to David, who will take the first couple of questions from the chat, and then I'll open it up to anybody who might. You're getting lots, I don't know if you can see your screen, there's lots of round of applause okay. coming from people. That's okay. fantastic. Um, That's maybe great. It is fantastic. Thank you very much. Maybe before um, we do that, I might just take a quick photo um, because we've got lots of people and it'd be great to have the claps up on the screen when I'm taking the screenshot. So if you're ready for it, give a smile for the camera. We're going to take a quick photo. And I will have to take one more because there's so many people attending. We'll just do one more. We'll just be a second. Just scroll down the page. Okay, so we're on to screen two now because we have so many people here. I'm going to get you to smile again for screen two. Look at that, oh, loads of claps, that's brilliant, I love it. Well, thank okay. you very much. So David, would you like to start with the, um, with the questions, please? Absolutely. So Julia asks, are the manuscripts that were stored on the third floor of Dunboyne House still in the library's archive? 
as far as I know, they are. Yes. Now, I don't know. How, if, I mean, I'm, I'm not a librarian there, but I don't know how many of them have been transferred to the new library. But certainly uh, the Russell Library is still in operation for postgraduates, for anybody who wants to go and study. And a lot of the documents, archives are still there. As far as I know, yes. And we had a question, um, I believe it was about that room that you were talking about, and it says, was it a ghost? Was it a ghost? Ah, well, now, this is where you're into the realms of your imagination. Certainly two students committed suicide because it has been recorded by the, uh, the people in charge at the time. Uh, what was going through their minds now would be unclear, since I think having slit their throats and jumped, they probably weren't in a position to say, um, but there you go. That's, um, it's just folklore and uh, it's a good story. Anybody else? We have uh, another question that just came in and it says, Logic House and Rhetoric House appear to be identical, but at right angles. Any particular reason for this? I don't know why they were built at right angles. I think they were built around the, the existing um, green area, which was Junior House. And I think there was land there and it was part of the Georgian part of the building and I suppose it was just uh, it kept everything together and it was beside Riverstown um, rhetoric is built right beside Riverstown and then logic round the corner so I suppose it provides the beginning of another little square block um, within itself and then closed that green area which you can still see today and you can still run around and play football on Would anybody else like to ask a question? You can just unmute yourself there. We've got James. Do you yeah, want to? Hello. Yeah, hello. I worked James. in a building. I worked in a building called the Callan Building for 30 years of my life. Oh, did you? My working, my working life, yes. And I never knew, I never knew a whole lot about Callan. I knew that he, he invented the induction coil, all right. Yeah. But uh, it was great to hear the background there about the, about the chickens and the people <laughs> joining hands. <laughs> From you there a few minutes ago but one of the questions yeah. i want to ask you is um was did was the college attended by daniel o'connell or was that any of the irish um, revolutionaries uh, attend that college uh not that i know of um i, I think daniel o'connell would have predated the, the the college i i no not that i know of um the duke of leinster who actually gave the land in the first place uh, had a brother who was Lord Edward Fitzgerald and he was one of the United Irishmen um, even though um, we're not sure whether the family approved or disapproved but uh, there, were, there was kind of no comment but uh, no I don't think Daniel O'Connell came here but I, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure I, I haven't come across that. Yeah, no, no I, I do have a, um, a great interest in, in Irish history and I read up about these a lot of Irish revolutionaries let's call them are Mm. Yeah. But a lot of them attended Trinity College and got degrees in Trinity College and all that. And I'm just wondering why uh, there's, there, was, there was very little mention of, um, of uh, St. Patrick's in, in Manute and why there is such um, a divergence between, yeah, you hear a lot about Trinity College, but mm. there's very little about education in, um, in Manute. Yeah, I think that's probably because Trinity College was set up by Elizabeth I and it was a university. Whereas St. Patrick's was more for training priests, and um, so there's probably oh, a different yeah. type of, of uh, educational um, setup. And um, also, it, it was 1795. It was you know 1800s really before it was up and running. Was Trinity's go gone back to 1600? You know, it's a much older establishment. But also, Catholics weren't allowed to be educated, so there weren't very many of them being educated. Um, there, there were, it was, it was the Protestants that, that were allowed but, to attend. Yeah, the SMC. That's probably why you hear about them, yeah. Yeah, thank you very much. Cheers. We have a couple more questions in the chat. Um, the first is, do you know where the name of the graph came from? The graph? Uh, well, apparently it's, uh, now I don't know whether it's the same length as Grafton Street, but it came from Grafton Street. And the irony was the students couldn't get out of the college and um, because this was part of becoming a priest, you know, you were confined and uh, your whole life was uh, within the walls there. And um, so you didn't get to Grafton Street to walk up and down. So this was kind of their big, their big outing up, up the main uh, drag, if you like, up the main street of the grounds. So it became known as Grafton Street or the Graf, um, and that's where that came from. 
The next question is, I walk the college grounds every day and behind the back of Logic House, it appears to be gated off. What is behind there? Uh, the, the gated half, well, there were some prefabs there, but there's a ball alley. Uh, they, used to, they used to play ball alley. It was one of the um, things that they had set up for students, I think, to get their recreation. Uh, and the, the, there's, I think it's just Meadowland there. Now that's where, it's at the back there where you had the original brewery and where you had the gas works. And I think um, that, that, that was the reason, but I think it's mainly because there are prefabs there which belonged to the science department and experiments were going on there. So possibly it's just a safety thing. Um, perhaps it's also to confine people walking through it today just to a certain path. The, the junior garden is there, and that junior garden um, behind Logic is uh, the original garden of Riverstone House that belonged to, um, it was a widow, a, a, a Mrs. Craddock, who actually was living there at the time, and that was her garden um, of Riverstone House. Thank you. A couple more Do questions. Do you think, oh, sorry. Sorry, no, you're on. Do you sorry, think you the yew tree there, in the front is the oldest tree in Ireland? Sorry, do you think the yew tree in the front is the oldest tree in Ireland? It is reputed to be the oldest or one of the oldest, yes. I think there was something done on that very recently and they have dated it to around that time. So every time you hear of storms like you do today, you just hope the Silk and Thomas tree will survive and won't get mm -hmm. um, knocked down because uh, it's kind of one of the features of the college. People actually ask, um, where's the Silk and Thomas tree? Which tree is it? And um, yeah, it's very, it's very famous. Uh, don't forget yew trees. Uh, it, it dates from the time of the college and yew trees were really important because that's what they made their bows and arrows out of, which is what they used for their form of fighting. So you will find yew trees um, in, in a lot of historic venues like, like the Maynooth Castle area. I think we've covered all the questions that we got. So I might just hand us over to Helen now our Deputy Librarian. Thanks, Elaine. Pat, I'd like to start by thanking you. That was absolutely tremendous. I've Thank been you. Uh, for 20 years and I've been a student uh, here uh, earlier than that. And really, I learned so much. And um, I think when I go around, I'm going to have to be a lot more aware and looking out. And now I know what to look out for. So thanks so much for giving us your time and an excellent talk. And the visuals were wonderful as well. It just brought it all to life. Thank you very much. I'm glad that um, it's the same with myself. I can now see things that I never realized were there before. So um, it's, I, I've enjoyed doing it and I've enjoyed giving the talk. And thank you very much for being so supportive and so welcoming. Well, thank you for sharing all this with us. Can I also thank, somebody's dog is barking at Bruce. <laughs> I think. Can I also thank Elaine Bean, our library events manager. When we've moved, we've moved to having events in Zoom. You know, there's a lot of work involved in it. It's wonderfully successful, as you can see, but behind all that, there's a lot happening. So thanks very much, Elaine, for all that. Yes, thanks very uh, much, Elaine, for all your help too. Absolutely. And can I also thank David Reinhardt. Uh, some of you uh, may not know David. He's a more recent addition to the library than myself and Elaine. Uh, but he's been working on technical support on this too. So thank you very much, David.